we'd like to extend our sincere thanks to uh, Sam Adams uh, Lanham, the community engagement librarian from uh, the Barrington Area Library, whose help and technology have made today's forum possible. Sam is our co-host today and she'll actually be operating the webinar. During today's presentation, all audience members will be muted. We will not be using chat or raised hands features. All of the questions that the candidates are gonna to answer today were submitted by the audience, uh, either at the time that you registered or from other uh, local nonpartisan organizations. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today, Kim Inman. Kim's been a member of the League of Women Voters for the past five years. She currently serves as the League of Women Voters uh, of uh, Palatine Area Vice President and has served as an election judge for 17 years. Interestingly, Kim joined the League of Women Voters after attending a school board forum because she was so impressed with how it was run. Kim's moderated many forums since then, and we're very fortunate she's able to be with us this, uh, this morning. So, uh, Kim? Thank you, Kathy. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be with everybody this morning. I so appreciate the candidates. Um, as a resident of Palatine, I'm not eligible to vote in this election, so I've been asked to serve as an impartial facilitator uh, for this discussion as a volunteer. I'm a volunteer with the League of Women Voters. Um, let me take a few minutes to explain the format and the rules for this forum. All of the candidates were contacted by mail, email, and phone and have agreed to abide by the ground rules provided by the League of Women Voters. They are as follows. Candidates have drawn numbers, but uh, to determine a speaking order. I will, ro I will rotate this order uh, during the forum as, as I ask the questions. Each candidate will have two minutes for their opening statement Next, each candidate will have one minute for each question. I'll repeat the question if necessary, and if needed, a rebuttal may be requested. Each candidate may use a maximum of two rebuttals. Rebuttals will be timed and limited to 30 seconds each. Then at the end of the questions, each candidate will have a one minute closing statement. Okay. Um, so each candidate will be given a 30 second warning. Our timer this morning is Jackie McGrath. She's timed many a, many a forum. Jackie, will, you'll just be doing the 30 second, correct? Okay, so you have a 30 second warning um, in, your, in your one minute answer and your two minute uh, opening statement. Uh, so please quickly compose your thoughts or complete your thoughts before you see the top of the card. Time limits will be enforced out of respect for all the candidates. Questions have been submitted um, at the time of registration. So um, by local organizations and people who have, have registered for this event. Each question will be answered by all of the candidates. Um, the questions have been reviewed for clarity, appropriateness, and to avoid duplication. We hope to cover a wide range of topics that are pertinent to um, all of you. Candidates have been asked not to inter interrupt one another. As um, Sam said earlier, today's forum will be taped for the League of Women Voters for use in educating the public. A video of this forum will be available early next week through the League of Women Voters of the Palatine Area website and the Barrington Area website, library website. Candidates have all agreed to this. No campaign signs, buttons, or partisan materials may be visible on screen no voice, image, or dupl other duplication of the forum may be used by a candidate's representative or campaign in any campaign advertising. The League of Women Voters claims copyright ownership of all recordings or transcripts produced from this event and reserves the right to publicize this forum. All right, today we'll be hearing um, from candidates hoping to represent the Barrington Hills. We have six candidates vying for three seats. With us today and on the ballot are Brent Burval. Do you want to give a little wave? Hi there. All right, thank you. Um, Laura thank Ekstrom. You. Laura. Paula Jacobson. Thank you. David Riff. Good morning. Tom Strauss. Good morning. And Bob. <laughs> 
<laughs> all right, I want to thank you all for your participation. We'll begin with your two minute opening statements um, by the numbers uh, that we drew earlier. We'll be starting with Laura Jacobson. You'll have two minutes. I think you mean Paula Jacobson? Paula Jacobson, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been melded. Right to get, yeah. <laughs> and, and, on my, and on my screen, you're like uh, like this as well. And on my list. All right. I'm so sorry. Paula Jacobson. Right. First, I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk to the residents about why I'm running for re-election. I would really like to talk about why I'm so passionate about this village and why I want to protect it, but it would take way more than two minutes. So I'm going right to my elevator pitch and going to my notes. So I want to talk about the issues that I think are really important to the residents. Obviously, one of them is fiscal responsibility. I think we've done a good job over the past several years on that, but there's always room for improvement. And we always need to keep in mind that we have to prepare ourselves for unintended um, situations in the future, such as ensuring that we um, uh, fully fund the police pension. Our five acre zoning is important. Obviously, that's a area of a kind of a, it seems like it's kind of a buzzword these days and there's a lot of things behind it. And I hope to get into talking about that a little bit more later. Our privacy, our safety, of course, I believe that we should continue with to fully fund our um, police force at its current staff. We have two open positions we need to hire for. Our property rights. I mean, it's nice to be able to do what we want on our property um, without big government intrusion. On the other hand, we have to balance that rights without infringing on the rights of others. So where rules exist, we need to apply those rules equally to all. I believe transparency is still a big issue in our village. I know that we've, Bob and I have worked towards trying to improve that in the past. I think we still have a long way to go. We wanna facilitate more resident involvement by having video streaming, by having more better communications to the residents on important issues, improving our website and having more things documented on the website. And I'm hoping that with a, you know, a new mix on the board, a new president and a new mix of people on the board, we're going to have a more diverse group of people wherein there would be more openness to differing opinions and perhaps more of a collaborative sort of discussions about what's best for the residents and hearing <clears throat> from the residents and internalizing that and actually working and representing and being advocates for the residents of the village. And that's why I'm seeking your vote. Thank you. Paula. <laughs> uh, next up, Laura Ekstrom, your two-minute opening statement. Hi, I'm Laura Ekstrom. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Barrington and a 25-year resident of Barrington Hills, where with my husband, Larry, we raised our children. Um, I deeply appreciate the unique lifestyle here. I grew up in an area surrounded by 600 acres of forests and prairie and uh, lakes, and that was our playground where we rose horse, raised, we had horses, we raised wild game, we had a fish hatchery in our lake raising northerns. Um, I just feel very privileged to be able to continue that type of lifestyle by living here and I'm dedicated to preserving it. Um, I was asked to run for trustee along with David Riff and Tom Strauss uh, by our village president Marty McLaughlin and President Pro Tem Colleen Conisic Hannigan to continue forward the progress they made over the last eight years. And eight years ago, I was serving my sixth year on the communication committee. And I saw the issues that we faced at that time with a front row seat. Um, we had seen close to a thousand acres disconnect. Uh, we were spending uh, more money on legal fees per capita than any municipality in the entire country. Um, we were taking money from roads to support that and um, residents were becoming more and more divided because issues are being pushed where benefited some threatened others and um, in many cases we were able to resolve that but it was a very difficult time and when Marty and Colleen were elected they turned that around brought fiscal responsibility reduced the tax levy 37 uh, years in a row um, protect civility and neighborliness back to the uh, village. What I bring, along with the experience I've had in the village, is a background in business management and um, development from running an advertising agency for many years. Um, I bring a background in marketing consulting, which I'm doing now. And as a young floor trader at the Chicago Board of Trade, where I was one of three women out of 1,400 men, I bring a can-do attitude and an ability to be tough when needed. I'm committed to... St oh, stop. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> That's okay. I know. It's, it's <laughs> oh, 
Thank you. Thank you for your passion. Thank you so much. All right. Next up is David Riff. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. I am David Riff. I am also a lifelong resident of the Barrington area. I have three small children that I have lived in. I have, and then we've lived in Barrington Hills for over 20 years here. Um, some of my children go to, to go to Countryside Elementary, Barrington High, and also Barrington Middle School, where I also attended as well. Um, I'm a very versed person of the Barrington Hills area. I'm a lover. We're a very big horse people. We're, we're an equestrian family. Um, we love our five acre zoning. We love our neighborhoods. We love where we live. Um, I went to college out in ASU. I came back to this area and I married my wife. The reason is we all live in this bubble and we love our area. Um, I like to protect the five acre zoning very much so. I don't want any more disconnect in our village. We endure everything that we have here. I wanna protect our borders for everybody. Some of, I have a large piece of property behind me that was disconnected many years back and it was a travesty because we lost, I think a thousand or 1500 acres out of it. And I just think that if we can keep our village together and we can keep it sane, we can have a nice, great community with it. Um, why I'm running for candidacy right now is I came on the ticket with Laura Ekstrom and Tom as well. And we decided to become a pack and run and see if we can better and continue what the current administration was doing for the past eight years. and follow through with it throughout the, uh, the upcoming election. Thank you. Uh, next, Bob Zubak. Uh, good morning, everyone. You know, the pandemic has created some unique and complex challenges for our village. So it has, it has exposed a variety of weaknesses and issues, which I believe it would be important for the uh, village board to address. One of the top priorities is to update our communication options with residents. We need to create greater transparency within the village so residents can stay informed. We need to update audio systems and remote meeting capabilities so residents can stay involved. Uh, live streaming for meetings I think would be helpful. We may need to make better use of the village website, uh, get residents back involved in the environmental, equestrian planning and communication committees. All these will keep residents engaged in the village government and improve transparency. Another item for the board to address Ooh. is the examination of our R1 zoning laws. Over the past year, many issues have developed and have come to the attention of the board. What are the rights of special use projects versus residence rights in R1 zones? And Airbnb is challenging the village that it does a lot, the code does allow the use of Airbnb in the, in the village. There should be a new, should there be a new designation in R1 zones for special use per, uh, permits for larger properties. These are a few issues to be addressed by the new board, along with the continuing issues of protecting our five acre zoning, defending our equestrian lifestyle, protecting our borders from de-annexations and from further dense population housing developments on our borders. We need to lowering taxes, adequately funding the police pension under changing uh, changes developing next year, providing services to residents need and want to promote a healthy community and pass an ethics policy to the village board. If reelected, I will continue to work on all these issues for you. Thank you. Oh, well timed. <laughs> well timed, well timed, thank you. Next up is Tom Strauss. Hi, and again, thank you for inviting all of us. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach because we, we the, the, the group, David, Laura, myself, and Laura and David, they really kind of reiterated what our stance is. We love the village. A couple of weeks ago, we were on a meeting when it warmed up. I sent everybody in our group a text. I go, this is why we live here. This is, this is what we love about this community five horses riding down the street at the end of the day. I had a horrendous day. I'm like, okay, now I've got a totally new perspective on life. I'm home in this wonderful community. So we all, we, that's where we're at, you know, and I'm a 15 year Barrington Hills resident, 25 year Barrington resident. My children all graduated from here. They're all successful. We've got a great community extended as well as Barrington Hills. Love, love where we live, but it no means. Uh, when the outgoing, trustees and Marty called to ask me, it was the same thing. I, I, I said, well, what am I going to do this for? And I'm going to do it. And Paul, you actually kind of said it, said it right, because it's time for a new mix. I was here 15 years ago. This village didn't work when I moved into the village. Over the last three years, I've had a lot of experience and a lot of uh, 
dealings with the village itself, it works today. I want to see that it continues to work, that we don't go back to the old days where things don't work. Uh, you know, and the, the eight years ago, you had a bunch of people that joined the board of trustees who weren't insiders. Everybody was out from, from outside. They joined, they fixed the village. We're on a great path. We, and then our group wants to continue it on that great path. You know, and me personally, because I know we'll get into issues, I just want to assure anybody that's voting for me that I will make virtually every trustee meeting without any issue. And I've said this on other boards I'm on, if I have to miss more than 10, 15% of the meetings, I'll just resign and I'll have, let, let them fill up somebody be in it. I'm dedicated to being here. Again, perfect timing. Thank you so much. Uh, next, Brent Verval. Hello, good morning. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, the most important folks on this, uh, in this forum, of course, would be the voters, but I would like to introduce myself a little bit here before we talk about all of our common loves of the village. Um, I've, um, resident was born in Barrington, or excuse me, was raised in Barrington and, uh, am a Barrington high school graduate. Uh, I've lived in Barrington Hills for about a decade now. Uh, I live with my better half, Jessica Underwood, on Old Dundee Road with our horses and goats and all the other critters that we're so fortunate to be able to keep here in this village with our wonderful property rights. Um, I, uh, I hold a civil engineering degree and work as a technology entrepreneur and uh, am very familiar with solving complex problems, have made a career of that, and I'd like the opportunity to apply uh, my problem solving skills on, uh, you know, by, uh, by looking closely and working with village residents uh, through greater communication, greater collaboration than I have personally seen uh, when attending meetings over the course of the last handful of years. Um, I, uh, I am very much uh, dedicated to protecting our borders, our zoning, of course, and frankly, echo a lot of the other candidates uh, goals. I think we all share common goals. I am, running I am running independently, which I do think sets me apart and have represented some of my neighbors in recent months on village issues that they could not represent themselves on due to COVID concerns. Um, I'm self-funding my campaign. I don't need to make any promises to anyone. And uh, I was endorsed by the Herald yesterday I was pleased to see that. And if elected, I promise to serve all residents with balance and fairness. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, that concludes our opening statements. Um, before we get on to the questions, just a couple of things. Um, so the focus can be on the candidates. Um, I would like to request that anybody in the audience stop their video. Um, so we can just you can, you can still hear it and see it, but um, we just would like to just see the candidates only. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and at, as we move on to the, to the questions, you'll have one minute for each question and we will alternate the starting order um, from from our opening statements. Again, one minute. Um, so the, the first um, first person to answer in this round will be Laura Ekstrom. You, the question is, what do you hope to accomplish if you are elected as a village trustee? Okay, it's somewhat similar to my intro. Um, I hope to continue the fiscal responsibility, protect our borders, protect our five acre zoning, you know, the roads have been specifically is a background in communication, having served on the communication committee and knowledge of the village. And I would like to see more open communication between the village and the residents. Um, I think there are a lot of ways to approach that that would be very effective. And so I would see that would be an added value. I also delve really deep into the issues that come through the village and um, I'm an experienced negotiator. I strive to build consensus and find win-win solutions so that it addresses the needs of all residents, not just some. 
So I guess I'm committed to preserving this village and I, I bring a lot of skills and I balance some of the others because I'm more focused on the communication and marketing. Great, thank, thank you. And let me add also, you finished before the stop. If you're in the middle of a thought and the stop okay. sign comes up, feel free, to, feel free to finish it. All right, thank you so much. Um, next up is um, David Riff. What do you hope to accomplish if you're elected village trustee? Well, I'm heavy into tech. I'm a CIO for a company I've been employed over 25 years with. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, the communications with the area. I know years ago, the, 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 the village didn't have the opportunity to do Zoom calls and things like that what we're currently doing. Um, today, it's a whole nother ball game. We can do Zoom calls, live Facebook chats, things like that, and allow the residents to view and see our community. I'm also big on security. I have small children. I want to protect them. I want to make sure that our security and our Police force is very is up to date, and I know we did purchase some new cameras and some other things. I think we could also elaborate on it and make that a little bit better. Um, can you, I'm a multitasker. I do many things at once. I'm an office dad, is what they call people. Come with me with a million problems every single day. They line up at my door every morning when I go out when I come into my office, and they just ask me to solve questions. And I'm able to solve and multitask and give you know a clearable answer to everybody and help with a simple a simple way of problem solving. Um, I want to keep this village perfect. I love where it is, and I just want to keep it together how it is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Bob Zubak, what do you hope to accomplish if you're elected village trustee? You know, I hope to accomplish again a lot what I said in my opening statements, but the main thing is I want to really continue to see more resident involvement in village in the village government. And I think that's one thing that's changed over the years that I've been involved on the board, that you know, many of the committees have kind of been de-emphasized. I think we need more voice from the residents as far as how things should be run, and quite frankly, what their concerns are. I'm not running with an agenda. My agenda is to serve the village residents and what they want to have in this village. And that's what I'm gonna work on to, if, if reelected. Thank you. Um, next, Tom Strauss, what do you hope to accomplish if you're elected village trustee? Fortunately, as I said in the opening statement, I think the village is, is on a really great path right now, and it, we're, we're all touching on it a little bit. I, I, I think that what needs to be done here is the open communication, and it is different. In my small businesses, we've changed the way we, we've done business in the last 12 months, and we've changed it two and three times already. So I think we need to look at how we're managing the village from a resident's perspective. And I think we need to compartmentalize things like you do in a small business. And that is, it, there are issues that I've heard about since I started this path here. And some of the issues are neighbor issues. We need to get the neighbor, you know, literally work as a community, get the neighbors together and see if that's working out, making sure nobody's violating any of the laws or the rules of the community. But you know, try, try to make this a friendly, approachable government. And it is now, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not saying it's not, but you know, kind of just expand on that and make sure that everyone knows they're always welcome and they're always available to see on any, you know, to David's point, any of the meetings, we'll Zoom them, we'll figure out how to use technology to the advantage of the residents. Thank you. All right, uh, next, Brent Burbaugh, what do you hope to accomplish? Well, the founders of our village gave us a great roadmap. We love it. Um, I don't hear many people saying that they want to change it. They want to preserve it. And um, I, I don't like to disagree with some of the others on, you know, in the forum, but my experience at village meetings over the past eight years has not been quite what I would have hoped for from a collaboration standpoint. Um, I felt it a little bit... Um, like I was an outsider. And if I accomplish one thing, it would be to improve vastly on that through all means possible. Um, in inviting folks to learn the process on how to comment, et cetera. Right now it's a little cryptic, um, but I think we need to do a really good job of partnering with our uh, friends, our large tract landowners, um, Barrington Hills Farm, I believe, was very interested in annexing into the village. And I don't have insight into everything that went on, but that didn't happen. And I'm afraid that was because of some of the things that have been going on in the current administration, Paul and Bob excluded. <laughs> Thank you. Thank well, you. Um, and wrapping up, Paula, what do you hope to accomplish if you're reelected? 
Well, I mean, I, a lot of what I said in my opening statement as well, and I think that really everything that's been said so far, I would absolutely agree with. Uh, one of the things I think that we haven't really been talking a lot about is forward thinking and forward planning. Uh, we have a planning commission that really doesn't meet very often. I think that that could be a more active committee. I think we have, as Bob mentioned, a lot of challenges that have come forward to our R1 zoning with regard to special use and, you know, just wanting to change, you know, uh, the existing code that we have or just the code not being um, specific enough to say, for example, you know, a Airbnbs or short term. So that is being challenged. I think these are things that there's just little chinks in the armor that we have to keep on being diligent and ensure that our ordinances are up to date with the changing times and so that we continue to protect our five acre zoning and protect ourselves from encroaching development, et cetera, and protect our own privacy rights, our own property rights. Thank you. Okay, um, on to our second question and David will be first. We'll Yay. Yay, Paula kind of segued into it. The question is, how do you feel about furthering development in the village? Well, I surround Barrington Hills Farms. My properties are the southernmost border of it. Um, they are all north for me. Currently, I love Barrington Hills Farms. It's a great place to walk my dog and it's, it's a lovely area throughout. I don't think that we should subdivide any portion of our village to a smaller piece of real estate. I don't think that's advised. I don't like that. I like, again, where we have in our five acre zoning. Um, some of the other, you know, some of the other areas in the village, I'm not too privy of at the moment, you know, are trying to de-annex and trying to get into the village. And I want to basically protect our borders as much as we possibly can. I want to try to work with Hoffman Estates to see if we can protect and get a agreement going with them so we can protect our southern border over there because I do have some residents and friends over there that live in a southern area down there and they would like to protect the Hoffman Estates area. The past administration and the past past administration kind of tarnished all that and they have a bad understanding with Hoffman Estates. We're going under, I've, I've been told recently, we're going under a new deal with South Barrington with a border agreement and Algonquin recently with a new border agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is Bob Zubak. How do you feel about furthering development in the village? Uh, you know, in, in general, I'm, I'm basically a lot of things that David said, I'm not for further developments within the village. I think, you know, again, we've all talked about how much we love living out here in the open space and the five acre zoning. So I think we need to, again, as a board, and, and as Paul said, as maybe as a planning committee, think about how we can limit developments within the village and on our borders. I mean, the border agreements are very important. And I think, again, to protect further or protect the village from further de annexations, we need to think about properties in the village so we don't have those further developments on our borders. Um, you know, what's going on with some of the demographics? I think you're, there's going to be a, a challenge to more development happening here over the next couple of years uh, in the village. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, Tom Strauss. How do you feel about furthering development in the village? I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that everyone seems to have a single mind on this one. It, 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 we need to protect this unique community. We're all privileged to live here. It is a unique community, one of the most unique in the entire United States, and we need to do everything we can do to protect it. So, you know, if it means we have to re figure out how to mend the fences, so to speak with one village so we can protect that into that, then that's what we need to do. I mean, that's, that's one of the steps we'll have to do is really try to work with the, the villages where we have a few issues with. But I'm not in favor of changing anything that has to do with our, our community in the way it sits today in terms of zoning and um, development. Thank you. Um, Brett Burval, what are your thoughts on furthering development in the village? Well, we're primarily residential and I think we all wanna keep it that way. Um, I, one of the issues I've been actively involved with recently is a special use property that has desires to expand. Um, obviously there are, um, there are options for that that are built into our code, but that's a small example um, of the things that come along and whittle away the resid residential neighborhoods uh, and things all across our village. That's a small piece. On the other end of the spectrum, we have our borders. 
I think we need to protect from within and on the outside. Uh, I agree with everyone. We need to work with uh, stakeholders, not just municipalities, but large landowners that might own land at our borders and outside our borders, adjacent to our borders. Um, if we work with our residents and improve the collaboration we've been talking about, I think we can all come together with some creative decisions, uh, creative ideas that can be implemented without raising taxes and continue on as we have, enjoying the village as it is today. Thank you. Um, Paula Jacobson, how do you feel about furthering development of the village? Well, I concur with everybody that uh, we, do, we do not want further development as far as anything outside of what is already allowed by our R1 zoning. I think that we have, again, as other people have noted, challenges to that. We have challenges, like Brent has said, within the village. We have challenges on our border. I think David brought up a good point about intergovernmental agreements. We've renewed the one that we had in place in, with Algonquin that, if people remember, that's what helped prevent the due to development on our um, western border. And we've had a lot of challenges getting an intergovernmental agreement in place with Hoffman Estates. I think it would be great if we could get one of those in place, but they really are not inclined to do so. Um, it doesn't benefit or serve them. And I think that's a really, really um, important issue for our village because we, you know, I live on the south end of the village and, I, and it's not like I only care about the areas I live in, but I live on the south end of the, the village border and I don't wanna see the south end go away and become a Hoffman Estates. So I really think uh, definitely as a board, we need to come to um, better solutions to help prevent further de-annexations in the future. Thank you. Okay, uh, Laura Ekstrom, how do you feel about furthering development in the village? Well, it's a great question. And actually I'm all for further development in the village, further development of conservation areas, further development of prairies, further development of open space and promotion of conservation trusts. Um, so in that sense, I am for further development of all the positive things about our village. Um, I think it's, it's crucial that we avoid feathering, we avoid planned unit developments, we avoid the annexation and we strengthen our border agreements. That's essential and that's what I believe must, we must continue to be vigilant. Um, it's, you know, having been involved in the village, you realize how fragile this situation, this lifestyle we all take for granted, this rural lifestyle is, and it can change so quickly if you don't have people who are vigilant at defending it. And I'm committed to doing that. And I'm also committed to further the development of conservation. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, this next question is, fairly long and complicated and getting into the real nitty gritty here of the village. Um, and I'll read the question and noting that Bob Zubak will be the first to answer. The zoning, <laughs> <laughs> this, question is, this question is from one of your constituents. Um, the Zoning Board of Appeals is reviewing the non-commercial facility text amendment right now. With over 300 charities in Barrington, like the San Filippos, where do you stand on the issue and what restrictions should be imposed? Should charities be held to a higher standard? Well, I don't know that charities should be held to a higher standard, but the bottom line is what are these charity zones or how are they gonna impact the residents in their area? That's really been the issue. It's the issue on how residents can come to some kind of compromise what's acceptable. I mean, it's the residents around some of these facilities that are the ones suffer the heavy traffic and, and, and the noise and the late night parties and stuff. They're the ones who are, you know, uh, should be under consideration here. I think in all cases, you know, all residents are equal and they have equal rights compared to, a, you know, some party that wants to, you know, further the use of their property. But again, if it's impacting them, the best solution and really sometimes the only solution is that those two parties can come together on what's acceptable and, and what's a reasonable amount of, of this type of work to happen on those properties. Thank you. Um, would you like me to read the question again? Uh, Tom Strauss, you're up next. No, 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 I understand the question. Uh, yeah, I, I, this was asked to me by somebody else once before, and this is, this is a, a residential community and we, we need to make 
all decisions as a board for the good of all the residents. And I use this analogy with somebody. I said, we live in a, a great community. We all have private residences that we own. If we're if the resident is not doing anything against village rules, against the law. So if, if I chose to have a party at my house every night for the next 365 nights with 25 people here, nothing illegal, no illegal parking, no, I, is, that the, is that the right of the village to stop? You know, I, I think it is a neighbor issue. It is something the village probably needs to address because there is wear and tear on roads for events and stuff like that. But it, it, I, I really object to when someone calls out one in, one individual neighbor on, on some of this stuff. So is, do, we, do we need to set a law that says if you have 50 or more people, you have to come to the village and get a permit, weddings or anything? It, it, it's not a charitable issue. This is, this is a village. How do you want to handle high, larger parties on properties? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Brent Burval. Uh, like Bob, I think that uh, listening to neighbors is the most important uh, thing to do here. I personally have not talked directly with uh, neighbors of uh, the subject property, but in general, I think compromise is the best solution. Neighbors working with neighbors, as Tom said. I think that results in the best op outcome. Um, there's no reason why there has to be a winner and a loser. And as a matter of fact, these types of from residents are potential opportunities as well to, again, protect our open space and our way of life. Um, what would happen to some of these properties if they couldn't do the things that they want to do or are currently doing? Horse boarding is another example of that. Uh, some of these topics are pretty hot topics, but these are tools, um, horse boarding, um, you know, what the uh, San Filippo estate is looking to do. These are tools that if properly implemented without impacting residents in a negative way that they can't accept could help us achieve our goals. Thank you. Um, next up, Paula Jacobson. Uh, could you read the question again, please? Yes. The Zoning Board of Appeals is reviewing the non-commercial facility text amendment right now. With over 300 charities in Barrington, like the San Filippos, where do you stand on the issue and why? And what trans, what restrictions should be imposed? Should charities be held to higher standards? Okay, one of the things that immediately comes to mind is, is I don't think that char uh, the charity should be held to higher standards, but I certainly think that the residents shouldn't have less rights than charities. And I think that's at the core of the issue. When um, an organization or a group um, has more rights, whether it be a church next door to you or whatever it is, they should not have more rights than the residents next door. Again, though, I feel that there is a solution wherein we can allow charitable events to occur and that it doesn't impact negatively on the people on the surrounding neighbors. And I think some other people have hit upon that, but it could be the size of the property. I mean, if you have a you know, 100 acre property or 200 acre property, is an event with 50 people there really gonna impact anybody? So I think these things need to be evaluated and I think there is a solution and I don't think it's a one size fits all really. I think that we do need to have some good conversation about that, but also I do, we do need to, to take into consideration um, the input of the neighbors. Thank you, thank you. Um, Laura Ekstrom, do you want me to read the question again? Uh, no, I'm, I'm fine. Okay. Um, I, I understand the CBA is drafting a text amendment to try to address this one in the village. It's not really addressing a single issue. Um, where I'm always concerned is that when you start drafting a great deal of a cookie cutter complicated text amendment to apply to everybody equally, you lose a lot of flexibility. And our village, our properties are so different. I mean, you could have, you know, a barn in the middle of 300 acres or you wanna have a party, which is different than a barn on a private road surrounded by other homes nearby. You have to have flexibility to use special use permits or whatever there is to address the difference in these situations. Often when you draft a blanket text amendment with a lot of specific details, it, it 
it causes more problems than it helps. So I'm always aware of that. I know that was true with the lighting ordinance. Um, and I think this is a complicated situation that requires flexibility and foresight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and last on this question, David Riff. Let's hear the question again, since it was all the way, I'm all the way in the bottom. I know, and it's so, and it's so long. It's a long one. It's, it's, it's I don't want to of detail on it, so I just want to yeah, answer. It's a lot of detail and parts. Um, the Zoning Board of Appeals is reviewing the non-commercial facility tax amendment right now. With over 300 charities in Barrington, like the San Filippos, where do you stand on the issue and why? And what restrictions should be imposed? Should charities be held to higher standards? I think this question was more detailed to the San Filippos and their, and their philanthropy. And if you say things like that, like I'm understanding that people don't like some of the philanthropy and probably the traffic on their property. You can't alienate out just them because obviously like everybody else was saying, they have a larger property. So if they're having a polo event there, is, is that a charity event? And should we should the village shut them down for that? Or if they're having a Christmas spectacular and doing donations for the, the church in town, I, I don't think so. Because if I wanted to have if I wanted to have something at my home at the moment and I wanted to basically have a charitable event, am I subject to not having it? It just depends on your size of your property. They are they own a large mass of property over there. They can do more events and obviously they do contribute a lot to the community for doing such a thing, which is wonderful. I'm not doubting them whatsoever. Um, I think it's a zoning issue. I think if the event is too large or, or the neighbors are complaining, they should have a permit for such for a such event and they should be requested. Should they have a specific permit just for the San Flippos to have a Christmas spectacular at, at the residence and, and kick back to the community? I don't think so. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, um, on to our next question. Um, Tom will answer this one first. It's another, it's another uh, more complicated question. The village has a policy that they will not publish public comment any longer. Do you feel it manipulates free speech and tampers with the public's right to know? Should we stop timing public comment at board meetings? Is there a way for the village to communicate with all residents about potential hazards in the village? And what will you do to encourage transparency in the board's dealings? Can you read it one more time, please? Yes. I'm <laughs> sorry, sorry. I, I, my computer was dying too. I did plug it in, so that's why I was a little distracted. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, the village has a policy that they will not publish public comment any longer. Do you feel that manipulates free speech and tampers with the public's right to know? Should we, stop should we stop public comment at board meetings? Is there a way for the village to communicate with all residents about potential hazards in the village? <clears throat> and what will you do to encourage transparency in the board's dealings? I think we've stated, that at least the three of, the three of us that are running together have stated that the fact that we do want to be transparent with the, with the residents. I'm, I'm not privy to the fact that you the, the trustees or the board currently is not allowing public comment or anything if that you know I don't think that that's if that I don't know if that's going on but I'm assuming there's state laws and such that would you know prohibit us from doing certain things but yeah freedom of speech I think we're very very clear about the fact that we, we do believe that there should be some open forum there should be the ability for residents to communicate um, you know, so I, I think that w that's kind of what one of our platforms is. Let's make sure that the, with the new technology and stuff that's available, that what is appropriate and what isn't. I think you you mentioned something about limiting time. Uh, mm -hmm. In all transparency, on, on any board I've been on, there's a lim time limit for anything, for questions, for answers, for discussions. So absolutely, that would have to go on. That's not a freedom of speech. That's that's a time management issue for people that are volunteering to do something. So. Thank you. Um, Brent Verval. Well, um, COVID times are a little different. Um, previously, generally speaking, one could walk into an in-person meeting and speak publicly if they wish to do so. One of the reasons I've been representing some neighbors is because of COVID. We've got a sweet woman down the road from me who due to doctor's orders could not represent herself at meetings. I contacted Village Hall, I asked them if they would come up with a way to accommodate her. I even suggested that she stand on a cell phone outside the window of Village Hall during the meeting. They did not accommodate that. So I think 
we can do a much better job um, during COVID times. But beyond that, um, the thought of getting together with residents in a more casual way, perhaps for a half an hour, an hour before meetings, maybe that would be convenient for trustees and to allow two-way dialogue during meetings. I can't tell you how many times I've wished I could speak to the trustees during a meeting after someone makes a comment that is not accurate. And unfortunately a vote then ensues based on inaccurate information. And I think that's a travesty. Thank you. Um, Paula Jacobson. My pleasure. So there's a, that's a multifaceted question. So can you ask it again, please? Of course, I was going, yes. The village has a policy that they will not publish public comment any longer. Do you feel that manipulates free speech and tampers with the public's right now? Should we stop timing public comment at board meetings? What will you do? To, I'm going to skip the other. There's another part. Uh, what will you do to just for the sake of brevity? What will you do to encourage transparency in the board's dealings? Should we? The question is. You know, about publishing public comment and timing public comment. Okay, thank you. Um, if the village is no longer publishing public comment, that was not a board decision. Um, I actually absolutely think that public comment should be published. Specifically, if you give public comment and say, I want this on the record, that should be provided. I, I think, and, and if we had video streaming or recording, um, and we do have audio, so you can review the audio, but that's very difficult and complex. So I, I think it's very important. Like if I wanna know what the, the comments were at the ZBA meeting, I want to know that as a board member, I wanna have access to those recordings or to that documentation. So I absolutely think it's important to have that documentation of public comment. With regard to timing, I think there is an element still necessary for timing, but I think we can have some leniency on that. Um, and, and we do allow people to finish thoughts. Um, I think encouraging transparency, I mean, I do like the idea of having informal meetings, but we have to be careful about um, violating the Open Meetings Act. So I think maybe there is, should be a, man, a way in which we as trustees can respond to residents during the meeting and not violate the Open Meetings Act. Thank you. Um, Laura, would you like me to repeat the question? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I understood. The village has a policy that they will not publish public comment any longer. Do you feel that that manipulates free speech and tampers with the public's right to know? Should we stop timing public comment at board meetings? And what will you do to encourage transparency in the board's dealings? Well, it's my understanding that the village um, follows all the state laws related to public comment and the time limits are mandated by state law. So that cannot really change. Um, I know the village retains all the recordings of all the meetings, including public comment. I'm not aware of a policy that does not retain them, you know, in the minutes or whatever, you know, is, is done at the end. That I'm not sure of. Um, as for public comment, some things I would like to see and some things that have changed already. I know in the prior administration, they moved public comment to the end so that residents who wanted to comment might have to sit there for hours before they could say it. That was moved to the front of the meeting, which I think was a, a great idea. I would like to see um, the trustees to be allowed again to respond to public comment that was taken out during the last administration and that has not been restored. I think that, that would help more with an open dialogue. Thank you, thank you. Um, David. Hello, well, I lived in the era back in the day of some de-annexation of the Duda property. And I recall some of these board meetings where people were screaming and yelling and just getting off topic and shouting and just it, and going till to all hours of the night till midnight, one, one, two in the morning. No lies, it was madness. And you guys may have also recalled this. This is not, not the Zubik, just, just before all this. And it was off topic. And I, and I, as for public comment on it, I believe they do publish it, but I don't know what time frame. And I think they're asking for more for a live forum for live topics and live discussion, which I believe is it should be open. But if you go sit, as we all, we're all volunteers. So if we go sit down with an agenda to speak about, and then we get sidebarred by some crazy comment and it blows the whole agenda of the meeting, I could see how that can be deferring. 
I'm for constant conversation. We will upgrade this with our future with Facebook and with our live comments that we can do online with Zoom because the old system and the woman sitting outside the window with her cell phone, I know you can call in, but I don't know why that would happen. It's just, a, it's a different topic and I think we can do better with it and we will do better with it. It's a new Zoom era. <laughs> Welcome to it <laughs> as we're in it. All right, thank you. Um, and final answer from Bob Zubak. You know, I definitely think that we should publish those public comments that are, are written in because many times they're very well written and really delve deeply into some of the issues. Now, again, should those be limited if it's like pub, you know, public attacks on certain individuals or something? Yes. But other than that, I think they should be published. Secondly, I do think, you know, again, with public comments in the meetings, I think there is some latitude as far as when we let people go a little bit beyond three minutes. I think the minute, the law is it has to be at least three minutes allowed. You can go uh, past that. And certainly to increase transparency, the best thing we could do is give some response to those people who are giving public opinion. I mean, I think that's the frustrating part when someone comes in and gives public opinion crickets, um, there's no two-way two dialogue. I understand it's difficult. I understand you don't want to get the meeting too off topic, but even a, a comment that will follow up, get back to you, something I think would be helpful. So, uh, you know, uh, and, and the, I'm trying to remember what the third part of the question was, but I'm out of time, so. <laughs> All, right. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and speaking of time, I'm gonna consult with our timer. We are getting to the end of our questions section, unfortunately. Um, Jackie, do we have time for another question? So. I don't believe I don't believe we do, Kim. I think so. I think we have time for uh, just closing statements. Um, and let me ask um, Brent: Are you able to hear us now? I know you had some connectivity issues. I am sorry about that. Oh. Am I... We're good. All right. Excellent. Okay. Um, so now um, I'm sorry. We have so many more questions and no more time. Um, now we have, so we have to move on to our closing statements. Um, and Brent, I'm sorry, you just had your disruption, but you're up first for the closing statements. It's no, a one, and, it's a one do minute. Do we have a time minute, limit here? Okay. One minute, one minute, okay. a one minute close. All right. Well, first I'd like to invite anyone uh, listening in to visit my website at www.berval.com to learn more about my position on some of these matters and to reach out to me with any questions or concerns, I'd love to hear from you. Um, thank you again for having us today. Um, I think we've got a great field of candidates here. Um, again, using the tools we have um, available to us and coming up with new and creative tools to achieve the goals that uh, we're looking to achieve. Um, open space, as Laura mentioned, I am a big fan of our land trust organizations here and an avid environmentalist and spend a lot of time volunteering outdoors. That's another excellent tool. I think we need to use all of them, work together, and I don't think there's anything that we can't solve together as a community. And I look forward to representing all of the residents should I be elected. Thank you. Uh, next up is Paula Thank Jacobson. You. One minute closing. Just thank everybody for the opportunity to speak today and also to invite the residents as well with your questions that you didn't get answered to reach out to your Barrington Hills, Bob and I on our Facebook page. You can do it through email and we'd be happy to jump on a Zoom meeting or I'll jump on a Zoom meeting and talk to you and then continue to address your questions. Um, I've been lucky enough or honored enough to be endorsed by the Daily Herald, but what I'd like to say is that I'm endorsed by the residents. I'm here to advocate for the rights of the residents. I have no personal interests of my own for being a village trustee. Um, I do it because I feel it's important to have a diverse group of people on the board with diverse opinions and diverse interests so that we can represent all of the village residents equally. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, Laura Ekstrom. Well, I want to thank the League of Women Voters. It takes a lot of energy and effort to put a forum like this together. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to participate. Um, I think it's a great service so that everyone, especially in this COVID time, has a chance to learn a little more about all the candidates. Um, more info about uh, our backgrounds and what we're committed to 
can be found at the One Barrington Hills website, and we also have a Facebook page. Um, <clears throat> thanks to David Ritt, Ritt the IT guy. Um, and so you can find more information there. Um, I'm just say going forward, um, I'm excited about bringing new energy into the village. Um, I'm committed to all of the things we've talked about and protecting them, but I'm also open to talking to all residents. I always have been, people know that. I seek out a lot of different points of view when we're making decisions. And I deeply appreciate the uniqueness of our rural and equestrian lifestyle, and I'm deeply committed to serve to protect. Thank you. Uh, next up is David Riff. You're closing. I'm closing. Fantastic. Well, hello, everybody. Um, well, you can also read about all of us on onebarringtonhills.com. You can read our profiles. You can read what we're standing for. And you can listen and you can also answer questions or ask us questions on what our stands are. Um, some of the topics today were the Barrington Hills Farms. I would love for them to be back into our village. I'm all about borders and preserving our area. If I can bring another thousand acres back into our area, especially being one of my neighbors, I'm going to try my best. But the they're great philanthropists of the area. I know there's some issues with some neighboring things I'm not too privy of. Um, you know, it's nice to work that out with other neighboring communities. Also bringing back our borders in our Southern border agreements. I know the past administrations and the administration before that messed that all up to tremendously with, with Hoffman Estates. Maybe some of us or one of us can go down there and help out and smooth that over and possibly provide a border agreement with Hoffman Estates with a new administration and a new perspective on what we possibly can do. Um, as far as five acre zoning, I love it. And I'm, I don't think that's a topic or a question. And everybody, we're going to fix the Zoom thing. I know everyone's talking about Zoom. We're going to have the at the board meetings. We're going to have you so we can communicate. You can have so we can topic and we'd have topics and questions. Get with me anytime at onebarringtonhills.com or any of my other constituents here. We'd love to have your answers and questions. And thank you, Women of League voters, to, for having us today. This was fantastic. Thank you. Um, Bob Zubak, you're close. Well, well, I think again, you know, over the past four years uh, while being on the board, I certainly think we've covered the fiscal responsibilities of the village, have done a very good job. And again, lowering the tax levies, controlling spending and doing the kind of things for the most part and still supplying the services that the residents want. But again, I think our challenge is going forward is once again, getting the residents more involved in the government process, keeping them involved, listening to the uh, needs that they think they have, settling disputes between neighbors, and creating regulations and laws that serve everybody in the village equally. I think that's been some of the concerns that we've heard from the neighbors over the years. And, you know, again, I think Paul and I are certainly committed to uh, continue uh, the work we've done, creating greater transparency in the village, and uh, keeping things as they are, because like we've all said, we love living here. Thank you. <laughs> nice. Thank you, thank you. And um, finally, Tom Strauss, you're closing. Okay, thanks, and thanks again for putting this together. Very well run, great questions. So, you know, I take my hat off to you. I think that this was a w way better forum than the prior one we had. I didn't think the Herald dealt, dealt in the issues with us. So I'm just gonna say it's been said by, by my group of people again, I'm very proud to be running for this position with the group of people I'm with. We represent a very diverse group of neighbors. Uh, we did our uh, comparison of who we all know, and it, there is very few people that fit in the middle of our circles. So I think we bring a unique situation to the trustees position because we do reach very different groups of residents and that's what's important. We don't wanna make good decisions here for our neighbor, we wanna make decisions for the community, for all the residents and our group touches a lot of people from east to west, David's west, I'm east That's and everything in between. And it was unique that I could, we could see that we, we, we totally touch people in the village, which I think is very important. Thank you. All right, and now in closing, I'd like to thank all the candidates so much for being here this morning. Um, and we'd like to encourage all of you candidates and the public to recycle your campaign signs. Uh, you can uh, visit the League of Women Voters Palatine Area website at uh, lwvpalatineareaorg for details about that. And um, audience members, if you are not a registered voter, you can find registration um, information on our website as well. On behalf of the League of Women Voters and the Barrington Area Library, thank you all for coming. And don't forget, early voting begins March 22nd. 
There is plenty of voting information available on the League of Women Voters website. Please participate in our democracy by casting your ballot. Your vote is your voice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.